from Mythbusters and tested his home on the web. Please, huge, warm welcome for Adam Savage. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I don't need this. I took the microphone and I don't need it because I'm wearing one. I like redundant systems. Um, hi. Uh, my name is Adam Savage and primarily I'm a maker. Uh, this is some footage of me making uh, just yesterday or two days ago in the shop uh, working on Mythbusters, working on a machine of, well, it's just going to be really, really cool whether or not it works. I have no idea whether it will work, but I don't get to spend a lot of time in the machine shop. And my, uh, my cameraman's been using this really, really cool, uh, effectively, it's a kitchen timer with a 5D sitting on it, and uh, it allows it to do panning shots while he's doing time-lapse shots. Um, so I have a, a, a shop of my own in San Francisco. I call it my cave. and. Uh, it's a pretty complete shop. It's full of all sorts of stuff that I love, all sorts of stuff that I've made, and tools that I've collected over the years that allow me to work really, really fast. Um, I don't get a lot of time in that shop, so I want to utilize it as, as well as I can. What I do in that shop, I copy. Um, I made a lot of sculptures back in my early 20s, back when I first moved to San Francisco. Um, and somehow, at a certain point, when I switched over into working for special effects on film and television, somewhere in there, I fell in love with an original motivator of making things, which was making props and things from movies that I've always wanted. I've talked about it extensively online uh, and in talks. This is probably one of my prized possessions, my R2. Um, I built him from scratch over six, six and a half years. Wow, you can barely see that. I'm sorry. He's, it looks great. Um, a friend of mine said, you're building an R2, you're building a happiness machine. What do you, like, how could you be sad if R2 is in your house? Um, you've seen the board identity, I'm sure you're familiar with it. Um, I never know what's going to catch my attention. I never know what's going to pique my interest. But in the board identity, uh, Jason Bourne finds a thing in his leg that turns out to be a Swiss bank account number and he goes to the Swiss bank in Zurich and uh, finds a safety deposit box full of money and passports, and he dumps it all into this burn bag, this, this red bag. Um, and uh, a few years ago, I actually bought that bag. Yeah, that's, that's mine. This is the one that he carries throughout the embassy sequence. They built three or five or something like that for the movie, and, and I own one. It's also the wastebasket from the, the Zurich Bank. And I love this thing. I, I'm, I'm very, I was very excited when I found the guy who owned it and he was willing to sell it to me. But of course, in the movie, it's full of all these things like guns and passports and money and little objects in this hidden tray in the bank box. And I wanted all of that in there as well. So, because uh, it's not complete unless I have all of this. So, I, uh, I frequent this forum online called the Replica Prop Forum, which is a very, very large community. I think 18,000 members at this point. And it's a community of people just like me. They, they want something, they want it to be exact. So I started posting up all these pictures and screenshots from the Born Identity, looking for these things. Okay, let's start identifying what the money is. What is this little object? What is that little object? And slowly, over a period of about eight weeks, we, we replicated. Uh, I started doing the faxes from Interpol. I did, uh, found this weird old keychain. The, the, the contact lens case, I couldn't find one, so I photoshopped this myself. Uh, a medical pass, a French pa uh, license, a phone card in which I was actually able to find through somebody at the replica prop form the original photo of the cathedral at Chartres and actually plug it into a fake phone card background that I made and laminate it so I could fill this thing. These are all my replicas that go into the bag, the money, the passports, the black cards and everything. Now, uh, a few weeks ago, Norman Chan, one of the editors of Tested.com and I, we discussed it uh, in my cave, and it hit uh, YouTube, I think, 10 days ago. And in the last 10 days, we've got over 1.1 million hits, talking about this level of precise obsession. Uh, why, I have no idea. 
I, not exactly true. I have a little bit of an idea, um, and I'm going to try and frame that idea that I have in a wider context, because I think it's kind of important. If you like my hat, it's this hat. I want to tell you about this hat. This is, um, this is an exact replica of the hat from Raiders of the Lost Ark, one of the best movies ever made. Um, you know, there's uh, everybody who has ever talked about film has to admit that there's at least 30 films in your top 10. <laughs> and there's 30 films in your top 10 because there's all these different categories. There's not just, there's no such thing as just a film that's just good. There's films that are important to you, but maybe you can't watch them anymore because they were part of your development. I have saw Brazil like a hundred times when I was 20 and I can't watch it again but it totally informed who I am. And then there's movies that are like, you can watch from start to finish no matter when they're on, like The Departed. But I can't, de I can't defend that as one of the best movies ever made. And then there's Raiders, which is just perfect all around and super fun to sit through. And, uh, well, I'll talk about it a little later, but I, I always wanted a hat from Raiders and eventually found uh, that these guys make it. Um, these guys, uh, this is Mark Kidder and Steve Gelb. Pretty sure that's the right pronunciation of his name. Um, these guys wanted a perfect Raiders hat as well. And they looked at the original footage of Raiders. And they noticed that the hat in Raiders of the Lost Ark is actually different than the hats in the rest of the movies. And when they studied it, they noticed that one of the key differences is that the brim of your standard fedora is wider than the one that Harrison Ford wears. Uh, and it's a very noticeable in the film as opposed to the other two films. I represent there's only two Raiders films. <laughs> Just like there's only two Star Wars movies. Um, Deborah Nadulman is John Landis' wife. She designed the original costumes for Blues Brothers and for Thriller, and she did the initial sketch for Indy's main outfit for Raiders of the Lost Ark, establishing, I mean, if you can think of somebody who's had a greater hand in three more iconic costumes. Um, and Deborah admitted that, yes, she actually cut the brim of the hat differently in order to give it a different tilt, um, make it feel more like a vision of what George, and Steven's, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg had grown up with, rather than the actuality of the thing. Uh, and when they cast around the world for someone that could modify a hat like this for them, they couldn't find anyone to do it. So these two guys actually... Uh, took all the measurements they could from looking at screen reference and they formed a company. They formed a company called the Adventure Built Hat Company that makes perfect replicas of the Raiders of the Lost Ark hat. They make about 50 hats a year. They're over $600 per hat. It is without a doubt the best hat I've ever owned. This hat has stood and sat in the back of my car under blankets, under hot sun for days and it pops right back and you'd never even know. In fact, the more beat up it gets, the better it looks. And you know, it's a magnificent hat. But um, the story actually gets better because when they did a call, uh, RFP, around the world for the fourth Raiders film, um, these guys actually got the contract. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's their hat, the exact same hat as this, uh, sitting on Harrison Ford's head. They made 35 for the film. Um, and they're making more for the next Raiders film. Let's hope it's watchable. Um, they went all the way from fanboy to craftsman to authority, based nothing more than on their original desire. I've already stepped out of the box, haven't I? You gave me a box and I haven't stayed within it. Um, based on their enthusiasm, they went on this beautiful narrative arc. Now, back to the replica props forum. Uh, People post things for sale on this, you can buy movie props, but there are also a bunch of categories, paper props, costumes, film props, studio scale models of ships, spaceships, environments, and things like that. Um, and one of the, probably the most uh, 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 popular item on the replica prop forum right now is making Iron Man armor. So, I should go back just a little bit. I was having a conversation with a, a a really brilliant group of makers about six months ago. And we were talking about ways in which, they'd asked me to come to this meeting to talk about ways in which we could get kids interested in making. And I was bringing up the Replica Prop Forum as a 
as an example of the lengths that people will go to to make things that they want. And it's a, it's a length that I totally understand because these are completely my people. So I want to show you, this is a guy, there's a guy on the replica prop forum. This is just as Iron Man came out, so a few years ago. Uh, and he wanted an Iron Man helmet. Now there is a, a process called Pepakura, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, where a 3D model can be turned into a paper model which can be built. And then people on the replica prop forum take those paper models. Well, check this out. He takes a paper model of an Iron Man helmet begins to make sure that the planes are all good, then he covers it with Bondo, gets it smooth, keeps on covering it with Bondo, smooths it, primes it, paints it, uh, cuts out the ears, makes a little part. None of this is by anything but hand with like thumbnail files in his house, uh, and eventually makes himself an, a beautiful <laughs> fiberglass Iron Man helmet. Now, as a professional, maker from film industry, this is the most laborious way possible to make the, exactly what he's ended up with. It is, it is and, and one of the makers, when I showed them this, said, man, that is the long way around. And I agree, but at the same point, this was all that was available to him. That is like $15 worth of materials. And when you're poor and young, labor is the cheapest asset that you have. And I appreciate that. And I, when I'm thinking about getting people interested in making, I'm thinking about that labor that I expended doing all those weird things when I was a kid. And one of the guys in this group said, you know, I appreciate what, what it's an example of, but wouldn't it be great if we could get them interested in building their own things rather than on the things that pop culture feeds them? And this actually, this hit me to the core, because I both am a deep adept of pop culture, um, and also am an weirdly and, you know, sort of understandably embarrassed by my strange hobby of making costumes and commissioning things and building things that I want for no other reason than I want to connect with an object. Um, so my question is, is it pop culture? I don't think that it actually matters. I submit that it doesn't matter why you make things. I realize, I had to realize that <clears throat> the, the impetus of the first project that I ever made by myself was to make a, a, a James Bond suitcase. I wanted one of those, I grew up on Mission Impossible and James Bond, so I went out to my dad's studio and found this old suitcase and I put a piece of cardboard in it and I put lights in it with switches. You know, every Mission Impossible box had a switch that you click to blow shit up. And I wanted one, so it literally had blow that up and I, you know, I pretended I had this thing. Um, and that first making project, and then R2-D2, that's a direct line between those things. And that line that made me want to make those is the engine of everything that I currently have in my life today. And I have to pay an obesity and an appreciative, I have to be, I have to appreciate that impetus. Um, bacteria. So I think about this a lot. Um, Bacteria outnumber the cells in our body 10 to 1. We humans think of ourselves as the most successful colonizer on the planet. I would also submit that we could consider ourselves the colonized. Um, here's another way to look at humans. Uh, there's a guy in Africa who wanted to see the structure of an anthill. So he found an anthill and he pumped what ended up being tons and tons of concrete into this anthill in order to understand its structure and then he slowly began excavating this anthill and it turned out to be far larger, look at those things that are white are people, than anybody imagined. Um, and when you actually, I'm so sorry you can't quite see this, uh, when you actually look at this, what you realize is that these ants are building this massively complicated structure with incredible precision. And there is air conditioning, there are ducts for uh, noxious gases, there are trash dumps, there are baby raising portals. I mean, this is a city in every sense of the word. And when we start to look at, uh, there, here's, a small, here's a small version of an anthill. And you see it's you know, over two meters tall. When you start to look at the infrastructure of a modern city, uh, it doesn't make us feel so different. It doesn't seem so far-fetched to consider ourselves both singular organisms, but organisms that are part of a larger organism. Maybe this is a way to think about culture. Um, when I was in my 20s, like I said, I did a lot of sculpture. This is a, an example of one of my favorite pieces. 
um, I, discovered, uh, denti I discovered casting plaster bandages uh, and dental alginate. And I did all these castings of my body and I found all these old pianos and I built a bunch of pieces. And I had a girlfriend at the time who submitted to me that she thought my sculpture was actually fairly violent. Um, I, there were sculptures of guns, sculptures of bodies in pieces and things like that. Um, and I thought about what she said, and I realized that, I mean, I, good humoredly, I said, you know, that, that presupposes that I actually have a choice in the matter. I, I'm just making the thing that's occurring to me at the time. I've got these materials in front of me, and I'm seeing what they do, and I'm, I'm playing around. I don't think, necessarily, that I have a choice. And she argued, she was a philosophy major, I was certainly not, that um, she was arguing that that was an easy way out, potentially. Um, but at the same time, take a look at the history of, of portraiture. If you look at the history of the portrait, they're all attempting the same thing, the depiction of a human face. But there are so many different ways to do this. And these artists that are painting these portraits, they are not, they are solving a problem in and of themselves. But we, in retrospect, can look back at the movements created by different people's attempts to solve the same problem and understand that these artists are also conversing with their culture at the same time. They're talking to each other through the medium that they're using. Look at the history of the landscape from Ken Leto to Matisse to Richter to Rothko. I think of Rothko as a landscape artist. <laughs> um, so the question is, what is culture? And, well, again, this is an open question. Uh, in the turn of the century, a whole bunch of things happened all at one time. The American frontier was declared fully explored somewhere around 1908. My grandmother was eight years old. Albert Einstein comes up with a theory of special relativity. The telegraph allows instant communication all over the world. And trains become so fast and so reliable that it is the trains that actually require world time to be established so that we know that when we leave London at a certain time, we're going to arrive in Paris at a time that we can predict. Until the, around the turn of the century, Paris was like two hours and ten minutes behind London. Uh, it, no one could figure out where anything was. India had something like 300 different time zones. Now, the world is getting smaller, and all of these technologies are making it smaller, and it's no wonder to me that an art movement like Cubism comes out of, out of that type of culture. Everybody is looking at the same things. We are starting to look at film, fracturing moments and changing our perception of time and changing our perception of the portrait. And Cubism is a perfect example, Boccioni, uh, of... of the artists actually conversing with their culture. I think that culture is a conversation. Now, I look at Star Wars as a fantastic modern con conversation with culture. I think of it as one of the first movies that is about movies. I know Singing in the Rain is about movies, but, but Star Wars is unabashedly, and Raiders of the Lost Ark, unabashedly movies about the love of movies, movies about the history of movies and about what they did for the artists that made them. Cabin in the Woods, a great example this year of a movie about movies. It's a, con it's a conversation, and that conversation, while it's happening, is actually changing what's happening. And so, I always end up, when I'm thinking down these lines, coming back to Emerson, the opening lines of his uh, short book, called Self-Reliance. If you haven't read it, it is one of the great books ever written. Um, I'll read these. I read the other day some verses written by an eminent painter, which were original and not conventional. The soul always hears an admonition in such lines. Let the subject be what it may. The sentiment they instill is of more value than any thought they may contain. To believe your own thought to believe that what is true for you in your private heart is true for all men, that is genius. To believe that what is true for you in your private heart, isn't this the thing that we love about great actors is that they make something accessible to us and we understand when we see what they're doing. I think that culture and that outreach is the same thing. Jung would have called it the collective unconscious. So when I say that I copy, and that's one of the ways in which I meditate when I'm not doing all the other things that I do. I don't think that I'm actually copying. I think that I converse. And I converse because I have no other choice. That's what I do as a member of my culture.
Thank you. Thank <sighs> you.